Well, it's lovely to see all you folks here to talk about the doctor and this particular aspect. We've done this a couple times. We've talked about culture. We've talked about race on Doctor Who. Today we're talking about the F word, but not the four letter one, but some people treat it that way. <laughs> so we need to think about that. We need to think about what messages we get from the television that we watch and the films that we watch. In this case, it's Doctor Who, something I happen to adore and have adored for a long time. If you notice on the back table there, I've got books that date back to the 1970s because you used to be able to watch this program program on PBS like four years after it aired in England because that was before everyone got very cool with how things are done, right? Now we can watch it the day that it's aired and of course when they did the 50th anniversary special you could watch it the moment, the very time that it was aired. So it's really been something that's spread across this, this cultural divide we used to have with England. And so today I want to focus on the concept of the women who've traveled with the doctor and what they tell us about feminism across the years that this program has been on the air. So, first of all, the question of the day is going to be, who is the most feminist companion ever on Doctor Who, right? Uh, we have to think about that. Everyone's going to have an idea. We're going to come and see if we all come to the same one. Yeah, be thinking who it might be. We'll see if we all agree or not. And we'll have a little expert uh, discussion here online about someone, an expert who has an idea. Meanwhile, you're not going to find out till then. <laughs> yeah, y'all have a personal opinion, and with any media, your personal opinion is probably correct because you have given your own evidence to that opinion. But I'm going to show you some ideas along the way. Now, first we have to define feminism, which if you saw Emma Watson's speech to the UN, it was a very lovely thing, and if you haven't, you should watch it. It's a nice short thing, and it's a very good explanation of the fact that feminism doesn't mean we hate dudes. We happen to like dudes very much. We would just like to make the same amount of money they make doing the cool jobs they do. So it's not any kind of crazy man-hating thing. And we don't see that evidence in the doctor either. So if we were going to define it, it would take us all day, all right? So we're just going to think now, feminism had waves, kind of like a very good surf, all right? The first wave was when everybody learned how to vote, how to let women vote. And that was a big deal, 1920, we're tap dancing, we're voting, we're all good now. And then they went, okay, everything's perfect, right? Once you can vote, it's all perfect. And every other group learned that that was not really true. It takes a little more time. You have to ask for a few more things. So by the time we get to when Doctor Who first showed up in the early 1960s, we're talking about the second wave. And women are now thinking, wait a minute, I need some equality of culture. I need to be able to do the things I would like to do and not have someone tell me that I can't have that job because only boys have that job. Now, what's going on is the whole women's liberation movement is happening right now. In a lot of countries, I'm thinking England, but also America, right? But also, ha, the biggest invention for women in a long time. <gasps> oh my God, a person could decide if they were going to get pregnant. That was a very huge step in the whole female world, right? It didn't mean you couldn't have, you had to quit having sex, right? Because sex is a good thing. We like that. We just didn't always want to have a baby every two years, which if you were married for 20 years, you probably had 15 kids. Honest to God, you did. Think back. If you look family history, you'll find out that your great-grandmothers had 10 or 12 or 14 children in the course of their life. It's a little scary when you think about it. I have one. Right? That's, and of course, I'm doing this. What am I thinking? He's 16. I should be doing this. All right? So this is a huge change in women's lives in this period. All right? Likewise, in England particularly, they've had a female monarch. The leader of their country has been a woman for much of this period. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I think that's her. And of course, she's, she's meeting our Beatles dudes because, you know, how much fun is that? If you're queen, you can meet whoever you want. So that's excellent female power right there. I want Paul McCartney at my house today. And he came. Isn't that pretty cool? All right. So this is all going on in England as we're talking about it. And this is a lady that we need to pay some attention to in charge of the beginning of Doctor Who. Right? Her name is Verity Lambert, and she was a producer with the BBC, and she was brought the idea of doing this historical program that would teach children about history. Isn't that fun? It was educational. Nobody knew there was going to be plastic monsters and all that sort of thing. Um, so Verity was, and this was a huge job for a woman in 1963. We don't have a lot of female producers. Matter of fact, in today, we don't have a lot of female producers. So this was a huge step. And she has a bit of a mark on the program. She worked on it for several years. She helps give birth to it. While she's here starting Doctor Who, we come to the very first companion, who is the original Doctor's granddaughter, Susan. All right? Susan's a very cool character. When they invented the doctor and this traveling guy, they knew he would travel with people. 
And, you know, you want to balance it, a guy and a girl, that's just kind of, we like that look, all right? And they, it's TV, they wanted a young, pretty looking girl. So now we're going to have an old guy traveling through time and space with a pretty young girl. We need to make sure that that's not some weird thing. So she became his granddaughter. This is part of the conversation. First she was just going to be a partner, and they went, oh no, that won't work, right? So she became his granddaughter. And that's nice because it humanizes the character. He has a granddaughter. Now, the complaint was... Does as that make her a time too? Yes, it does. But she disappeared on us, so we don't get to see her travels. Yes, she is a Time Lord. Oh, we're going to see a couple other female Time Lords. There are plenty of female Time Lords in, in Gallifrey. We just don't go there anymore because it exploded <laughs> in the new version, right? So we'll get to that. Um, now, the complaint about some of the early female characters was that they were hired, the actresses would say, hired for their ability to... <laughs> because their job was going to be to stand there and go, ah, it's a big scary monster, right? That's not very empowering. <laughs> not a very empowering stance to take. However, while they were busy screaming, they were also often challenging the doctor as to what he was doing and how he should behave when he crosses into new cultures, which of course is something we chat about in lots of history courses and in the IGE stuff that I do. It's all about cultures coming together. And that's what the doctor was doing, right? So Susan is a really interesting character. I liked her. I was interested by her. I like what she did. She left the show to go rebuild Earth. She traveled to the Earth many times and seen it, you know, nearly destroyed. This, in this last episode she was in, Dalek Invasion. So great. She saw, of course, the Grand Daleks ruining the world. And so she chose, which is a staple of feminism, choosing the thing you will do with your life. She chooses to leave her grandfather behind, go travel without me. I've been there, done that. I don't need to see any more dinosaurs. I want to stay here on this place that's been ruined, and I want to use my female power to heal. That's what I want to do with the rest of my time. And I think that makes her a really very powerful character, despite the fact that in many early episodes, she screams a lot. <laughs> you know, so it's an interesting balance, all right? And I think that's kind of fun. Now, the other early first uh, partner with the doctor is Barbara. And this is a backstage saint, okay? And she's also here with the actress playing Susan. Barbara was a history teacher. Isn't that perfect? It's a show about a guy. <laughs> They're the coolest people I know. Heavens to Betsy. It's just like Clara. So we're seeing exactly. There's a little circle we're going to watch happen here, which I think is very interesting. Um, so Barbara, and that was the idea, that you'd need a history teacher to interpret the things that the doctor was seeing for the audience. But that also meant that a mature woman was traveling with him. She's a little bit of a mother figure for Susan, right? So she can have conversations about things with her. And likewise, Barbara has the intellect to challenge the doctor. You can't behave like that. I won't allow it. I have some power here. I know where this culture is going in history, and you cannot do a thing that will mess them up, right? So she's a very interesting balance for the doctor. In the very beginning, we have some very, I would say, feminist females hanging out with the doctor. And so I thought that was pretty interesting as I'm looking through this whole list of women. Because I knew all this stuff, but I had never really put it all together as to what it meant, right? So now we get Susan leaving. Oh, and this is another, I just love this box cover. The Aztec episode, exactly. And I love the cover with Barbara in the love of the Aztec. And here she had to learn a lesson from the doctor about the fact that she had to allow human sacrifice to continue because that was the culture in which he had traveled. And it wasn't his business to decide that their religious practices were wrong, right? Because that's not his business, it's their business to decide how they feel about it. So that's a good example of what she brought to him and to the debates on the show. Once she leaves and Susan leaves, we end up with Vicky, who's quite a lovely girl, but she does a lot of screaming. And she doesn't necessarily balance that out with much else. So we do a little dip here where we're not being very empowered. Um, and she left to marry a Trojan man because she traveled to the ancient, yeah, exactly. Um, all right, so uh, she left to marry a guy. She didn't go heal the world, fix anything. She just, like, fell in love with a cute guy wearing a little sort of short thing, and that's it. <laughs> so uh, I'm not too, too excited about Vicky, but, you know, we have to pay attention to who is here. Now, after her, we come up with Katerina, who's a really interesting woman. She's only in a short segment with the doctor, a short few episodes, but she risks her life, sacrifices her life, to save the doctor because he's more important in the world. She's made that decision. 
Now, part of that's a little like, ooh, I don't know. And then I went, but she made the decision. And that's the important thing about being a feminist person, a humanist person, right? She decided that he had something to give the world that needed to be allowed to continue, and she was going to sacrifice. So it's a very, very much like a nice military story where one guy has to throw himself on the grenade and that sort of thing. So Katarina's pretty cool. I kind of like her, right? We had two chicks in a row who did that, all right? Sarah Kingdom. So now we're thinking, what are the jobs of the women that he's going to meet, right? They're not all housewives. They're not girlfriends. They can't all be his granddaughter, all right? So who are these women? In this case, Katarina, excuse me, Sarah Kingdom is a double agent. So we have spies. Remember, now we're in the late 60s, the Cold War is going on, we think spies are very cool, we got the Avengers on English television, so, ooh, spy, a lot of chicks are spies. Really, in the real world, not that many were, <laughs> but TV and movies are our place to fantasize what we'd like to be. So Sarah's a cool character. If you notice here, there, she's, this is Jean Marsh, as an actress and a writer, she's a very important person, she's going to invent a program called Upstairs Downstairs which was the Downton Abbey of its day. It's going to be a huge success. She's going to star in it and write the entire set of segments. So this is so she's a very important performer and writer, as well as she's a pretty interesting character, right, that we meet along the way. And, you know, now we've got to get into a question, though. What makes chicks tougher is putting them into pictures with guns. <laughs> I'm not a fan of that. But frankly, our culture, and at this point, the English culture to an extent, has the idea that that makes them cool. It is. It's a cyber gun. It is. She meets Cybermen along the way. So, so I think that's an interesting thing to watch out for. Now, when Hartnell left the program, as we all know, the lovely act of regeneration, we move over to Patrick Troughton. And in his world, his first uh, new female companion is Polly, who, gee, has a cockney accent. So we're building into the later characters. But also they define her as kooky, even though, and here's the funny thing, she can't herself be a computer genius she can be the assistant to one. Aww. So a woman, you know, that's as close as she gets to being a cool job. You get the coffee for the guy who's the computer genius. <laughs> so that's not very empowering, right? Yeah, that's not too exciting. So we're in a little <laughs> dipping period. With yes, exactly. Um, then we move, again, notice how we're going to define women by the men in their life in this stage. Victoria, very cool character in many ways. She's the daughter of a Victorian scientist. She's not the scientist. The daddy is. All right. So mm, yeah. All right. So she knows some science because she's heard it growing up. You know, if your dad, whatever he does, you learn how to fix a car. You learn how to do math or whatever your dad does. Right. So this, the knowledge has worn off on her, but she hasn't obtained it for herself because that's really not something they're thinking about. But she's kind of a fun character. I give, I give her some points. All right. So Victoria. Oh, now, Cybermen. finally, some Cybermen in the world. The next companion, though, so notice how we're growing. She herself, Zoe, is a computer scientist. That's cool. We've allowed the woman to have the skill that can be helpful. So we're moving. I know, I'm very happy with that. Um, this is kind of cool. Now, she was also considered someone who brought the 60s coolness to the show because you got that sort of 60s haircut and she wore little mod boots and little mini skirts. So clothing-wise, she wasn't all that professional looking, but she had a cool job. So we have this balance that we're always doing, right? And she fought the Cybermen and won a couple of times, so she gets points for that. So Zoe, moving through the Patrick Troughton period, there's a lot of doctors to get through, right? We got to get all the way up to Clara, right? 13 doctors. There are. After we have Patrick Troughton, we have John Pertwee, who's quite a wonderful doctor in his own right. I know, some, some of us watched him first. He was, I think, the first one. And John, very elegant gentleman. I love the capes he wore. Very cool. His very first companion of the female kind is Liz Shaw, herself not only a scientist, but she works at Cambridge. We are now cream of the crop scientists. This is very cool. She works, yes, she, she, he meets her through working at UNIT. She comes from Cambridge to work at UNIT. And UNIT is the military group. You may or may not have seen that, right? So she's got a military affiliation again at this period. Liz Shaw is a really great character. Now look, she's older. So she has the ability again to match him intellectually. Makes a very good pair, the two of them. Notice she's such a scientist. We've got to have the test tubes. And this is the brigadier. He works at UNIT. So we have the military thing going on. Notice when chicks get smart, they put their hair up. <laughs> High hair means you're smart. Low hair, I don't know what that means. But, you know, we get this very serious look. Now, 
Sadly, um, this character uh, chose to leave UNIT. She got tired of working for the military. And in real life, the actress said she got tired of being the one who just played with the test tubes and he <laughs> always saved the day. Yeah, she was a little upset that her character didn't get more empowering moments. And that's, actresses have to make that choice. Actors of color make that choice. What kind of character do I want to be seen portraying all the time, right? What am I putting out into the world? In this case, she's like, okay, I'm done being the second banana. I'm going to go do something else. She went and did a lot of theatrical work, which is good for her. All right. Um, we move from Liz Shaw to Joe Grant, the second spy. <laughs> got to have another spy. Spies are cool. But, you know, again, got a kinky look going on. Look at me. I got the funny hair. I wear the very patterned clothes. Ha ha. I'm, I'm a humorous sidekick. Even though you're a spy. I don't, I don't think of spies and funny at the same, you know, but they do. All right. Um, again, we do, though, define her by her relationship to a man. She's the daughter of a sports journalist. She herself can't be a sports journalist because back in the day there weren't. All right, now there actually are women who can report from sports and talk to you about a game and the strategy and whatnot. But in this case, so that's kind of as cool as you get. Your dad did that, which I always think is very funny. All right. Uh, then what's fun about Joe Grant is in her grown-up years, she appeared on the Sarah Jane uh, show, the spinoff. Mm -hmm. And so this is kind of fun because we keep this Bible going. We keep this association with the characters. So she got later in her career to meet, of course, the Matt Smith version of the Doctor, and we see her paired with Sarah Jane, who we're going to talk about in a second, because Sarah Jane, look at the day, oh, she was such a cutie pie when she got, they were looking for that cutie pie little girl, but Sarah Jane is possibly one of the most feminist characters, she's an investigative journalist, so now daddy's not the journalist, I am, and it's not sports or entertainment, it's investigation, social justice. Let's go out in the world and find problems and solve them, right? So she comes in there, but you know, we got the whole fresh-faced cutie pie girl look. Can't get away from that. It is television, all right? They do want somebody pretty. But Sarah Jane is a pretty fascinating character. I just like that picture because they're cute together. And they're just very sweet. You can tell that they're having a good time working together, all right? But Sarah Jane follows John Pertwee into the Tom Baker era. So she's one of the longest running female companions that we have going along the way. You can see her getting older on screen. She gets more serious, although all of these women have their screaming moments. It is part of the job. But Sarah Jane gets to do more and more, which is fun, and she and Tom make a good pair. She also comes back in the David Tennant era, episode called School Reunion, which I love dearly. And so she's met the most different versions of the Doctor possible, which is kind of fun. All right? And this particular episode is a really lovely look at a feminist idea. She has spent some time after she lost track of the Doctor. He, he dumped her a little period there. She's been a little upset about that. She re-encounters him in his other regeneration. Didn't she slap him across the face? She did when she first met him because <laughs> he had lied to her for all those years. Now, what's sweet about this and important is that she comes to realize waiting for a man was not the way to spend her life. That she has other things to do. And her life, now that she's missed starting a relationship with this person, he makes a comment about, she can tell her grandchildren about her adventures, and she says, oh, I think they'll be someone else's grandchildren. Because she's lost that chance, because she's been so focused on one man, she didn't find another one when that one left. And this experience in this episode makes her realize, I'm in charge of my life. I need to go do what's good for me and move on. And so, in fact, she does. She moves on to her own program. <laughs> a spinoff of the show that ran for four years until the actress sadly passed away. Um, Sarah Jane Adventures, very interesting. I will say, it was a child's program, a child's version of Doctor Who. It was quite fun. I will say from a feminist perspective, we do still need a man in her life, but it's her son. She adopts an alien boy who has a humanoid, yes, and she becomes the mother of an alien kid. And together, they solve the, you know, different crises happening to Earth. So it's interesting. But of course, being the mother of the child, she's still always the one in control. So there's that change going on there. But so it's very interesting. So Sarah Jane might be the most feminist companion the Doctor has ever had. She might be. Uh, we're not sure yet. Who's she? <laughs> Margaret Thatcher. Not, not one of the you know, doctor's companions. But we're looking in the mid-70s now in a country that had a female lead. Mary Tam could be intellectually as smart as he is and do all the wonderful things he does. But look at this fluffy piece of stuff she's got to wear. 
He never wears anything full of feathers. <laughs> we never see him come out in his boxer shorts after a shower on the TARDIS. What? This is a problem. <laughs> this is a problem. So this is this is Mary Tam, Romana One, who gets changed into this actress, Lala Ward. Oh, no. Now, think about the difference in these two women and what they're giving us. They cast this actress specifically to get a softer, less bossy woman. They wanted someone, and bossy is a big word these days, right? We've been talking a lot about what does bossy mean and why are girls bossy and boys are not. Boys are leaders, girls are bossy. This is nonsense, right? But exactly, so that's a perfect example of how they went. They went forward and they got slacked back happens all the time. A couple steps forward, a couple steps back. Uh, really, what's really sad about Lala Ward is um, she's mostly famous because she married Tom Baker. <laughs> so completely identified by the man in her life who is actually the man she married. And then they got separated. So the marriage didn't last, which happens often, sadly, in art. But so, so we had Romana, a female Time Lord, the only one we're going to see in the course of the show. And we move on to Tegan... Very interesting, very fun character, very, very tough. However, the best job that we can give her in this period is she's a flight attendant. That's the coolest job we can give a woman. She's not the pilot, right? She's not even a military woman. She's a flight attendant, which is not a bad job. My friend has a job, but even she says to me, it's pretty much Denny's waitressing in the sky. <laughs> now, it's not, because she gets trained to do all kinds of important things if there's a crash and whatnot. But that's the job we find ourselves giving a female in this period, right? Not an entirely, you know, super intellectual job. Um, I will say, it's kind of interesting, that uniform, the idea that a woman in uniform, a person in uniform, is someone of power. That's something visually that made them happy. In very much the same way, I've got to tell you, segueing, when they came up with The Cosby Show in the 1980s, they wanted Bill Cosby to portray a man who could be respected. So they thought, what kind of African-American man could be seen wearing a uniform? And the only thing they came up with was a chauffeur. Because in the 1960s, the play Raisin in the Sun had a guy who was a chauffeur. Luckily, Bill Cosby's wife said, okay, wait a minute. Your doctor is an African-American. Your lawyer is an African-American. Everybody we go to professionally, you're not going to go on television as a chauffeur. And sure enough, they turned him into... A doctor. He got to play a doctor. However, thinking of softening, was he a neurosurgeon? No. What kind of doctor was Bill Cosby? Pediatrician or a baby doctor? OBGYN. Yeah. That doesn't take much doctoring. Babies just fall out. He wore silly sweaters. It's the, he wore silly sweaters. We, we, we tempered down the professionalism of that man. Very interesting when you think about it. All right, so Tegan comes along, and Tegan is pretty tough, pretty bossy, so we have to soften that. But she can't regenerate because she's not a Time Lord. So we're going to add a second companion in this period. The lovely Nyssa. Nyssa of Trocken. She's an alien. Another chance to have an alien character coming with us. She's actually a really cool character. She looks like she's not, you know, real tough because she got the fluffy hair thing going on. But in fact, not only is she equally intellectual to the Doctor, being an alien, she can match him culturally. He can't think he's better Right? Like, oh, humans are so much less than the Time Lord. Well, her people are just as good as the Time Lord. So they have a nice balance going on there. And when you put them together, she's a soft person to look at, but she's a very tough character, and she pulls him into place often. And she's younger than he is. So being younger, she still has a mantle of wisdom that she brings to the story, even to the point that when it's time for her character to leave the show, she doesn't leave for a dude alone. She does meet a guy on a planet. But he's a doctor, and their planet is kind of like a leper colony, and there's been this disease of affecting people for many years, and she wants to stay and help find a cure so the people on this planet can be healed. So she has a social justice cause in her life. She gives up traveling, having a good time in the TARDIS, to go do something of value in the world. So even though she's kind of got a fluffy thing going on, she got the little princess thing, I mean, honest to God, she's, she is the daughter of you know a leader on her planet. But she's going to do something of value. And so I think that makes Nyssa possibly a very feminist character. Uh, and, and so eventually that's when she leaves. I forgot. To, and she goes all the way through Peter Davison. Then Peter meets Perry Brown. Absolutely the worst screamer the show ever had. <laughs> Poor women did nothing but get scared and get kidnapped. It was just really, a, again, step forward with Nyssa. 
Step backward with Perry. Right. She hung around with Peter until he regenerated. Now notice we're getting into the late period here. She ended up hanging out with Colin Baker, not a very popular doctor. The ratings start to go down. And she's got the whole perky thing going on, right? We move into Sylvester McCoy and his female companion, Ace, who's a cool, piloty kind of chick, so she's kind of fun. Sadly, this is the era when the show gets canceled. Goodbye. 1989, oh no, no more Doctor Who. Everyone's so sad, right? Except this guy, Russell Davies, I have a plan. <laughs> of course, he's still not that popular yet. He, he had to get his career going, and then he was able to go into the BBC, and they said, you can do whatever kind of programming you want to do. And he said, I want to revive Doctor Who. And now we have Russell Davies writing, and writers are very important. We're going to talk about the writers in a little bit. He brings us, the very first episode of the very first reincarnation of the Doctor, the episode itself is titled Rose. It is entirely focused on getting to know this woman, who is not intellectually his match, right? She's not well educated. She's a shop girl, right? Which is not a great job to have in the world. However, she has, just like in the Disney movie Aladdin, she's a diamond in the rough. She has what it takes, but poverty has kept her from attaining her goals. So this chance to travel with this strange alien dude is a thing she takes. So she's willing to take risks in life and she makes a choice to better her life by attending this trip with the doctor, right? So she hangs out with, as we know, Eccleston for the first season. And then she runs into the David Tennant years, all right? And I will say that the change they make to Rose is Rose becomes the very first companion who ever completely falls in love with the doctor and he falls in love with her, which has never happened in the history of the program. So does that make them not just working equals, but now they are emotional equals, right? And that's a pretty interesting relationship to have created. Of course, they can't let it go on because then the show would be over. They'd get a little picket fence and a house and that's the end of draft line, right? So as you know, tragic things happen. Nobody dies, but they can't be together. <gasps> oh. And you can't separate them anymore. Exactly. It's very sad, very sad, right? But Rose is an interesting character. So there are those who say, yes, she's a feminist character, and then those who say, mm, but she's not very smart. So how do we, what, what qualifies, right? But she has made choices in her life. And the choices, in my opinion, are what qualify. Now, she is followed by Martha Jones, the very first companion of color, which is a very big thing for Doctor Who. And also, what's her job before she she's travels? She's an actual doctor. She's an actual doctor, which I think is the loveliest job we've given any of the doctor's companions. Somebody who is equally intellectually his match, no question about it. Not only do I do test tubey things at Cambridge, I fix bodies. And in later episodes, we'll talk about the doctor as a healer. So she's the ultimate healer, and she's a female and a female of color, right? She's bucked a system that doesn't always assist both women and people of color to attain these types of uh, heights, if you will. Martha is cool enough, first of all, to travel with the doctor. Second of all, She's going to end up joining UNIT and being just like Liz Shaw, a female assistant through this military connection that he has. And that's a pretty cool thing. And then she's going to end up married to Mickey. Now, this becomes an interesting question. She, following Rose, is the second person to fall in love with the doctor. Now, we can't have everybody do that or the show gets boring. So we know that they can't end up together. And he can't fall in love with her, too, because then he's just like a wandering Romeo. And then we lose all respect for him, okay? If, this, if the TARDIS is just like his purple couch, this is a bad thing. Changes the whole point of the show. So we have to deal with Martha, who recognizes how she feels, tells the boy how she feels about him, which is a very empowering thing to do, gets told he can't feel the same way and doesn't fall apart. She does the thing that is best for her. She leaves him. She says goodbye of her own choosing so that she can continue her life. She does not make the mistake Sarah Jane made 15 years ago. She is smarter and more together than that. So I think she's a pretty interesting character. Now, this all became an interesting question. Uh, we see that she's married Mickey, who was once Rose's boyfriend, way back in the day. 
This happens because production. When they filmed the episode that said goodbye to David Tennant, they wanted him to see all of his previous friends, right? And they wanted them all to have a moment where they saw him before he regenerated. When they scheduled these two actors, both of them had other jobs in films. They had only one day in which to film their scene, and it was the morning they were both free. So how was he going to come up with a scene that involved them both? And being a writer, he thought, oh, wouldn't it be fun if Smith and Jones got married? So that's what he did. Now, he ended up getting some flack for that, because there were people who thought what he was saying was people of color have to only marry each other. No, he was saying these two actors couldn't show up any other day but today, okay? So you have to have a little understanding of the, the process of production. I happen to think it's an excellent ending for Martha, because she didn't get the first man she wanted, but she found another one of equal value that she could build a life with, and in fact, they grew up to be ro rogue alien hunters. So she's still doing exactly what she did. So losing the man didn't force her to lose the job that she had with that man. She rebuilt it with somebody else. And to me, that's very strong. Now, after we get through Martha, we all know Donna. Donna. Donna's quite fun. She's funny. She's, she wants no part of having sex with a doctor. She's not interested in him in that way at all. So many people opt for Donna as the most feminist person. Um, after Donna and after David, we come up to Anelia Pond in the Matt Smith years, just as Natalie told us in the beginning. All right. And Amelia's a question. Right? Because she's a real mess up here. <laughs> she's been in therapy for a long time. She's never gotten her act together. When we meet her, she's functioning as a kissogram. Not exactly the job you hope your daughter grows up for. <laughs> Granted, she is more sexually advanced and she jumps on the doctor, right? When she first meets him. That's a pretty big deal. Um, she then is able to have a proper marriage with a balanced partner who she can respect and love. She can have a male friend with whom she doesn't have to also have sex, right? So she has taken some feminist steps in her life. I think there's some question there. Uh, um, River Song comes along, and there's always a question, does she count as a companion or not? I think she does, because she traveled in the TARDIS. She is pretty much one of the more kick-ass women you're likely to meet. However, much of her power comes from the gun. The fact that she is the one who will always carry a gun. So now I think we... She also is, we discover, right? Um, we also know that she gives up her regenerations to save the life of the doctor. So again, she's taking that sacrifice. She's making some pretty good choices. But that gun really bugs me. <laughs> I don't like the fact that we judge her power by that and not by the rest of her persona. She had a guy coming after her. That's true, but still, I think she can do without the gun. So I think we have to question that. What makes a woman... A feminist. Does she have to be a boy? That's not the same thing. The, a feminist doesn't want to take on male power. They just want the opportunities that are existing in the world, right? So the gun thing really throws me off. Hey, oh, in okay. Matt's year, Ew. now we have Ew. Madame Vostra and Jenny. So we have an alien lesbian couple. <laughs> Some people would say you can't get much more feminist than that. <laughs> Except feminism and lesbianism are not the same thing. Right? They shouldn't be construed as the same. They're not. <gasps> oh no! You don't have to become a lesbian to be a feminist, right? <laughs> That's not to say it's not nice to be a lesbian. One could be if that is what one is. And it's nice that they celebrate the fact that not only is it a lesbian relationship, it's an interspecies relationship. We're getting very broad and open on Doctor Who, right? So these are all very interesting characters. What now, year, what year was this? This just happened about three years ago. <laughs> yeah. So now, oh yeah, now we're in the modern world. Yeah, we came into 2005 with the rebirth, and we've been going strong since then. So, yeah, only in this era are we able to, on television, in a family program, have such a relationship and have it be a real fun group of people we like to hang out with. Now, our final uh, companion, as we know, is Clara, who we're dealing with right now. I have issues with the fact that she's nicknamed the Impossible Girl. I don't know what impossible means, and I don't like girl, because she's not a girl. <laughs> she may be, again, younger, and she has a kind of a Susan naive thing going on. They blended Susan and Barbara because she's a teacher, but she's got a little girl thing. And now that we've bring, brought the, the Peter Capaldi era in, there's definitely a grandfather, granddaughter -y feel. So it's almost as if we've come full circle, and we've got the same relationship that we started with in 1963. 
I am definitely at odds about Clara. I do not know that I would qualify her as a feminist. Now, the question I asked was, that means who is the most feminist companion following that? And you're all thinking now, thinking in your head, who am I going to pick? Who might it be? And the answer is somebody you can't even identify, can you? Um, Rachel Maddow? Mm. <laughs> Close! Close! That look, that's funny, that does look like her. Her name is Allison Bechdel. And she is a cartoonist who writes a cartoon called Dykes to Watch Out For. She happens to be a lesbian. This cartoon has become viral in the film world. And this will help us discuss who's the most feminist character. In this cartoon one day, she discussed her requirements for going to a movie. What a movie required. And it's now come to be known as the Bechdel test of movies. And her requirements are, one, it has to have at least two women in it. Think about some movies that don't have two women in them, all right? They have to talk to each other. That's point two, not just the boys in the movie. And they have to talk to each other about something besides a man. Those are the questions she asks herself before she pays money to see a movie. That's the Bechdel test. So now you've got to think about movies that you like and whether or not they pass. This is likewise what test we put to Doctor Who, and these were the results. Uh, only with the modern companions. They didn't have time to go through everybody, right? Modern companions. Notice Donna wins. The one character who had no interest in having sex with the doctor becomes the one who, for the most part, spoke of other things when she was in scenes with other women. I think that's really interesting, all right? Notice Martha's next in line, all right? Rose after that. And Amy's pretty low on the scale. That's pretty interesting if you think about it. Now, a lot of her episodes, she had to deal with Rory, so she's not always in a scene with another woman, so I have an issue there. So now I have to think about how that balances out. The marriage was a good thing, so I don't know if not talking to another woman can be taken against her. The other thing they, they tested when they did this was the two male writers, all right, of the program over the last regeneration of it. Russell Davies, who have I mentioned, I mentioned already, is an out-of-the-closet gay man in England, has a better scale of passing this feminist Bechdel test than does Stephen Moffat, the heterosexual married guy. Man who spends his life with a woman doesn't think about how women are represented in his work nearly as much as the gay man. That's a funky thing. That's a little confusing. So in this scale, they pick Donna, all right? I have a problem with that. Donna ends her life with the doctor, married to a guy, and that is the ultimate goal in her life. And she's not going to have a job. How's she going to make money the rest of her life? Well, she's married. It's true. She's married a guy. But she does get some money handed to her. Who remembers how we get rid of Donna? Lottery tickets. She, the doctor hands her a lottery ticket because traveling in space and time, he goes to the future, figures out what lottery ticket's going to win, then buys it in the past and hands it to her. So there's not... And then, yeah, so maybe she talked to women more in her scenes, but I'm not getting a whole feminist vibe off Donna. Frankly, if it's up to me... Martha. To me, Martha is the most feminist character that has ever traveled with the doctor. I believe based on her job choice, based on the way she handled the doctor, she did in fact save his life at a certain point, which is akin to the earlier episodes, right? She made the choice not to have her heart broken, not to sit around and wait and beg and plead for something she couldn't have, and then she built a life without the first person she wanted. To me, those are very, very powerful statements being made by that character, and I think it's important to pay attention to. Now, that's my personal choice. Obviously, people have many other choices. I do want to talk about this briefly. It should not take women writers to write interesting women characters. We shouldn't need that. However, in 50 years of Doctor Who, guess how many female writers they've bought? How many women have written episodes of Doctor Who in 50 years? <laughs> Two, a little bit higher. Five. 50 years. 50 years, they have only found five women that they've let write this program, and that's them right there. Go back to 1966, once in 1985, twice in 1985, excuse me, once in 1989, and twice in 2007. Now, uh, Helen Rayner also wrote for um, Torchwood, which was Russell David's spinoff, so he appreciated her work, obviously, and hired again, again, the gay male hired the woman to write more episodes than any other female had ever written for that franchise. So that speaks to a lot of what's going on, because in this time period, think about all the famous women 
science fiction writers, right? It's a big deal that Moffat went and got Neil Gaiman to come and do the show, and everybody's, ooh, Neil Gaiman wrote an episode. In the time the show's been on the air, Octavia Butler was alive. Not anymore, but she was, right? Ursula Le Guin was alive. There are lots of female science fiction writers out there they could have picked. They never did. They picked five women out of 807 episodes. So I don't think it takes women to write cool women, but then again, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I wasn't thinking about that right. I don't know. But to me, that's the story of feminism on Doctor Who. Wow.